The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Morning. Um, the title of this message is Winning the Invisible War. And I think all of us understand that we are in a war, that when we got saved, we enlisted in an army, and we need to know how to wage war along with our commander-in-chief, who is Jesus. And in understanding our position as a warrior, we need to start out by understanding the authority of a believer. We need to acknowledge that we're in a war. And um, 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. But James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, we realize that when we come together on Sunday mornings for intercession, that we are agreeing with God that battles will be fought and won. A battle is a smaller component of a larger war. And now as individual believers, we are in um, daily battles of various kinds, um, just a a daily basis. And battles are fought on different fronts for different reasons and with varying degrees of intensity. And the same is true in spiritual warfare. Okay, what we're already equipped with is authority. We have authority over ourselves, over our homes, over our children while they're still members of our household. We have authority. And we, if we have properly cleansed ourselves, we can stand in that authority over anything that would come against us. And it's been interesting over the the years, um, I have been really well protected under Dennis. He has taken the brunt of um, pressure and things he's felt. I have never seen him, when he felt like there was an attack against us, have to do more than quietly pray in the spirit throughout the day. But it, for the most part, has not affected me because he's the head of the household and he stands as a covering over the household. Next, in our spiritual authority, our dependence is on God and the power of God. Um, Finally, overcoming in the strength of God, we rely on his power in us. And we have to remember that none of us can match Satan on our own. He's too strong for any individual believer to go up against. He's been deceiving humans for a long time, and he knows what tools and tricks to use on us, and he knows our weaknesses. However, we can be alert and recognize his wiles, as it said in 1 Peter 5, 8. And we can know his devices, and knowledge can be part of that power. Now, for a believer, Jesus is in our spirit. We have God inside. And to understand um, one of the strategies of our warfare that God wants to connect with us. He wants us to yield in our spirit. He wants to impact or transform our soul 
And ultimately, he wants us to express Jesus. He wants to express himself. He wants to express God through us, Jesus through us. And this is the whole, this is how we're conformed to the image of Jesus because he has more and more of us and we express more and more of him to the world. We just uh, studied the book of Philippians recently and we saw how Paul magnified Jesus in the eyes of the Roman guards so much so that many of them turned to Jesus. They, uh, before they met Paul, they hardly had an idea of who Jesus was, if they had ever even heard of him at all. But because of Paul expressing Jesus, even though he was bound in chains and in prison, he made Jesus great in their eyes. And this is what we're supposed to do as our witness in the world to make Jesus great in the eyes of the world. Now, the devil wants to connect, own, and express us. As a matter of fact, we know that spirits seek bodies to live in. So, But he works from the outside trying to make a connection with us so that we'll own it and then express him one Amazing example of that is the Gadarene demoniac who thoroughly expressed the demons that were in him in a horrifying way. Now, God's on the inside. We're fortified on the inside. The only way that the enemy can connect with us so that we so that he owns us and we express him is through our two doors. And I love it when Dennis teaches on this, the the um the teenagers at one meeting just loved this. We've got a mind door and we've got an emotion door. And if the emo if something the enemy attacks our mind with a thought and he can get us to fear, guess what? He's got us. I remember a political figure, famous political figure, um, that that I knew was a bad person. Um, but I listened to a speech. And this is really interesting because gossips do this too. They test your spirit. There was such a powerful, seducing spirit on him. I could feel the attempt against my spirit. And this is, by the way, this is how um, the enemy has uh, gained access to Christian young people who were <coughs> formerly good Christians, but now they're woke with things like don't homosexuals deserve love too? And all the enemy has to do is make that connection and they're hooked and they're brought into captivity in that area of their thinking. But the thing is, the seducing spirit of lust is not love and love is not necessarily love because the love that comes from God is pure and it's clean. And I, I've been rather distressed by um, Christians not being able to recognize the presence of the Holy Spirit, but they also can't recognize the demons on people. Um, I remember going to the mall with Dennis, and there was certain one particular store um, where goths and witches would hang out, and you could feel this dark emptiness on them. And uh, I, of course, do not have the discernment that Jason and Dennis have to that degree, but I can certainly pick up on things. And, you know, what are we doing as Christians if we can't recognize the anointing of the Holy Spirit and we can't pick up on the demonic on people because of their various sins? Um, I think that's one thing that we need to become better at, pay more attention to. And that doesn't mean we want to go in suspicion because God's ultimate goal, even in these people who, who, were, who were the goths at the mall, God wants to redeem them. Now, this doesn't mean that there aren't some people who um, God wants to just deal with and get out of the way because he knows they will never turn to him. It doesn't mean 
that you would have to, if we were slaves in Egypt, it, we wouldn't have to pray until Pharaoh got saved. There was no way that was going to happen. So God just did away with Pharaoh. And But what we can do is pay attention to our thoughts and to our emotions. Now, the way we're made, the way God made us, we're like a closed feedback loop. We know our thinking brain is up here, but our emotional brain is down here, the enteric nervous system. This is our emotional processor. Now, this emotional processor does send information to the emotional center in our thinking brain, but pretty much left to ourselves. Let's picture us before we were saved. A closed feedback loop. Now, God wants to connect with us. He wanted us to get saved. So what happened? At some meeting, we opened our emotional door, the door of our heart to him, and God got in the loop. He broke into our feedback loop. Every time we're in prayer, every time we connect with God, more and more of him is released into our spirit and from our spirit into our soul and ultimately to our physical bodies. Eventually, we're going to have a completely glorified body and God will entirely own every bit of us. But, and by the way, right now, I have a great burden for believers who are sick, who are suffering, who are in pain, who have chronic conditions, because I want to tell you, that can, just, that can derail your whole destiny. I mean, there are just some things you can't do when, when you're dreadfully sick and or your body doesn't function properly. And, of course, it's been prophesied, and I believe it, that we're going to see an explosion of divine healing in the church because no more is the devil going to destroy our destiny through our physical bodies. Now, there are things we can do, like um, emotional open doors can open the um, avenue for some diseases to affect our physical body, and we can close those doors. And so... But that's not the whole answer. So I believe that, well, it's been said that in the days coming, in this outpouring, that it will be commonplace for believers to come to meetings and just about everybody would be healed. Catherine Kuhlman saw that day coming where actually most of the people coming to her meetings did not get healed. A small number did get healed. But eventually, that's going to turn around. So the majority of people are just going to be healed when they come into the glory. So this is what this I am looking forward to that day. But in the meantime, it's our responsibility to watch our doors and close open doors. What the devil will do, by the way, he'll put a thought in our mind. Do you know the devil can put thoughts in your mind so you don't just go ahead and think every thought that comes in your head is your thought? But then the way he gains access then is say you get a bad report from a doctor. You give in to fear. Well, that gives the enemy access to begin tormenting you on that. So the devil is a legalist and will take advantage of any open doors. And by the way, if you feel demonic oppression coming from the outside, don't give in to it. I had a um, tremendous battle with fear. Dennis and I got uh, met and got married, and he called me a little much afraid for about the first year. I was afraid of everything. And so we had dealt with many open doors of fear in my life. And I guess we've been married, I don't know, months and I woke up at night, and I felt fear in the atmosphere. Now, at this point, we had been whittling away at my fears and dealing with open doors. And so what I did, I dropped down to my emotions and checked 
inside me where God dwells. And I felt peaceful inside. So the fear was in the atmosphere coming at me from the outside. So I said, oh, it's just you. And went back to sleep. We don't, just because we feel something, just because something attacks our head, our emotions, we don't have to give in to it. So, and it takes practice. And whatever you practice regularly becomes a permanent part of your life and you become better at it. Now, what happens if you accidentally do give in, take in some fear, or take in something negative in the atmosphere? Receive forgiveness for accidentally taking something in and your peace will instantly be restored. So one of the best things that I think is taught here because it's so easy is the principle of letting the peace of God rule. And that is so easy. It can be taught to little children, if they learn to deal with their negative emotions and they learn to recognize the peace, the presence of God in their lives, they're better at it than adults. We have um, two of our children's books cover the river of peace that runs through God country that we always have access to. And then we have the School of the Spirit children's book that teaches children how to actually practice, tap into and practice the various fruit of the Spirit. Love, kindness, peace, joy, they actually practice experiencing that. For example, um, we have for expressing the fruit of kindness, we have good deed cards, and children can be taught, ask God what he wants you to do as a good deed, and then while you're doing it, you let the love of God flow out. If you're going to do something for somebody, let the love of God flow out to that person. It makes it a real experience instead of a, a bulletin board concept that I learned as a young Christian. But I didn't know how to tap into the fruit. I didn't know how to live in it. The peace of God was a mystery to me. And joy, well, forget joy. You know, I, at that point, peace would have been preferable to the fear that I stayed in most of the time. So, now, one thing I did not exactly cover in the children's books was wearing spiritual armor. Now, I was taught as a young Christian to say the words. I put on the helmet of salvation. I take up the shield of faith, all that. I was taught to say the words, but I wasn't putting anything on. I was just saying words. Now, once I learned how to tap into the fruit of the Spirit from Dennis, it became more of a reality to me. But we can teach our children how to do it and not just say it. So I want to cover wearing spiritual armor because we are at, we have started um, doing corporate warfare down here uh, at the building on Sunday mornings. And so I think it would be a good idea for the adults here certainly to know exactly what is involved in really putting on spiritual armor. Romans 13, 12 in the Amplified says, The night is far gone and the day is almost here. Let us then drop, fling away the works and deeds of darkness and put on the full armor of light. Now, for intercessors, we need to understand that the armor we put on is individual, but it's also corporate. Actually, in, in Ephesians 6, it's talking about corporate corporate armor over a mature church. However, just like in Revelation 3.20, commonly used in winning people to the Lord, tracts and so forth, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now, Jesus is talking to a church. 
And he says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Now we know that that happens when we get saved. We open the door individually and then we can hear our voice because he's in the loop. But Jesus was speaking this to a church, but this implies that the individuals in that church needed to open their doors corporately to Jesus and welcome him into their church. And by the way, not all churches will welcome Jesus in. I mean, there are lots of churches who actually are fearful of or teach against the Holy Spirit. Now, we know that what the Holy Spirit wants and what we want in this place, we want the Holy Spirit to completely take over and us just follow him and follow what he does in our corporate prayer meetings, in our uh, Tuesday night meetings, and I think we're going to see amazing things happen in the days ahead. But now, for a church to wear corporate armor, the individuals in that church must be wearing their individual armor. Otherwise, it's meaningless. There can't be corporate armor if, if the people in the church are acting like the devil. You know, it's just not going to work. So for corporate armor, we also need our individual armor. And this armor, by the way, unlike a, a lot of the um, books that are out there, the armor is not something God gives us, but us being clothed with God himself. Internal reality of God in us being expressed outwardly. Now, Ephesians 6, the the full armor of God chapter, Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Actually, Watchman Nee has a book on Ephesians that's called Sit, Walk, Stand, which is the stance that we take in his book, and I love anything written by Watchman Nee. But then, in verse 14, we're given a sequence. We're given, given an order. Stand, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. Sometimes that's called a belt of truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the firm foundation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. So let's start with verse 14. Stand therefore having girded your loins with truth. <clears throat> Now, the first of these three items, the girdle of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, and the shoes form a group. This is the main group of what we need to be clothed with. By the means of these three items, we are enabled to stand in victory. Now, as the verses go on, along with these three items, we need additionally to take up the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. Now, what does it mean to gird our loins with truth? Now, we know that Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. 
So truth is not something. Truth is someone. Truth in the Greek means reality. Reality refers to God in Christ as the reality of our living. God made real and experienced by us in our life and in our living. And we covered this in depth in the book of Philippians. Paul said, for me to live is Christ. That Christians can go about their day and they can be in their flesh sometimes and they can be in their spirit. So they're not living Christ all day long. It's not their daily life. It's not their everyday living. We need to check everything by the cross and make sure that we're staying in our spirit as we go through the day. We need that's living in truth, that's wearing continuously truth as the belt, the um, girdle that strengthens us in everything, every step of the way. Jesus himself lived out by us. The only way we can do this is to practice. And one of the things that, that Dennis has brought up is to continually run things by the cross, continually run things by, is this pleasing to God? If I say this, is it pleasing to God? If I do this, is it pleasing to to God. I want to tell you that will fine tune your daily life if you run everything by that test. Philippians 1:21 Paul said, "For me to live is Christ." This Christ that Paul lived was his girdle of truth. Paul never removed the girdle of truth. And Paul expressed and revealed Jesus in his daily walk, in his actions, in the way he lived when he was a prisoner. Because Paul's daily living was conformed to the pattern of Christ, and we talked about when we in Philippians about Jesus as our model, and Philippians 2 goes through that, how to make Jesus our model, that, that um, he did not grasp at his equality with God, that he laid his life down, that he was obedient even to the death of the cross, that he died as the just for the unjust without making complaint, complaint. And we are told in Philippians to lay aside selfish ambition and complete and, and selfish ambition and conceit and look to Jesus, how he lived as our pattern. Because then Paul had been girded with truth, he was strengthened to stand. And I don't know about you, but I've often wondered at the things that Paul suffered physically. I cannot imagine physically being able to endure all that he suffered. But he never complained about it. He never accused God of being bad to him because of the things that he went through, because of the shipwrecks, because of the canings, of the, um, the whippings he endured. Not to mention how just the travels, traveling itself in the first century was a horrible experience, a dangerous experience that involved a lot of suffering just on that basis. And... You know, have you ever thought about this? I like my house sprayed. I don't want roaches or bugs in my house. I, if, if I get a house fly in my house, I, I am a warrior on a mission to get that. What did they do about fleas and lice and, and bugs and stuff in their houses back then? I mean, to me, that alone would be torture. But we, we really don't understand what 
Paul endured, nevertheless, he stood. And when he gives the principles of warfare and the principles of the armor to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 6, it's because Paul had lived this out himself and he knew how to stand in the power and might of God. But we can start by living the fruit of the Spirit, which is how Jesus lived his entire life before he ever did any signs and wonders the last three or so years of his life. He, that was his perfect humanity. He perfectly lived as a meal offering, fine flour, ground finely, so there was nothing that was coarse or unrefined in him. He lived perfect humanity. And you know what? This Jesus who lived per perfect humanity lives in us. We don't have to do anything more than yield to him as we walk through our daily life and yield to him and let him live that perfect humanity through us. We don't have to pray for patience. And what's that verse everybody um, hates on, on patience that if you ask for patience, you'll get trouble. No, no, that's, that's really not true. We don't have to ask for patience. We yield to the one who is patience in us. It's always as simple as going to Jesus and yielding and letting him be whatever it is that we need. This is knowing Jesus as our girdle of truth. To make it very simple, beginning with what we teach the children, we let the peace of God rule in our everyday life by quickly dealing with anything that causes us to lose our peace so we can get back to peace. And children from a very young age can learn to deal with their negative emotions and begin to live in peace. So even very young children then can wear the girdle of truth in their daily life. They can learn to fall in love with peace and stay always connected to the river of peace in God country. And by the way, the enemy can't touch the fruit of the Spirit because Jesus himself is our peace. And the enemy cannot get past Jesus. Now the breastplate of righteousness. Philippians 4.6 says that the peace of God which surpasses our understanding will guard our hearts. That's referring to the emotional part of us. Now the soldier's breastplate covered the area that we now see uh, when somebody puts on a bulletproof vest. It's covering the same area that's covered by the bulletproof vest, pretty much from the base of the, the neck down to the loins. Now, that's not just for protection of the physical heart. That's protecting the abdominal area. And, and Dennis has told me that, that back when he was in training, when he was in the Army, that they were told that how bad belly wounds were, just how absolutely horrible those are. So this is that the peace of God will protect our emotions. The breastplate of righteousness will keep our emotions covered, protected by peace. Now, also, we know that in our spiritual heart is our conscience. So we've got our emotions and our conscience that need to be protected. Now, righteousness means to be right with God and right with man. So for spiritual warfare, then, we need peace to guard our heart but we also need our conscience to be without holes. So we need our conscience covered and our emotions covered. So 
Next, the shoes of peace. You know, I don't think if I'd been writing the Bible, I would have put the shoes of peace next. I, I think um, I would have put something else next. But anyway, Paul is directed by the Holy Spirit, put the shoes of peace next. And this is one thing that's in the children's book, is wearing shoes of peace. Now, we know that in our daily walk, we need shoes of peace. We walk in peace. Uh, verse 15, having shod your feet with the firm foundation of the gospel of peace. Now, our feet here are not just walking, though. They're for standing firmly and fighting the enemy. The firm foundation of the gospel of peace means establishing the gospel of peace in our lives. Now, Jesus made peace for us on the cross, both with God and man, and this peace has become our gospel. Well, where does it say that in the Bible? Actually, it does. In um, Ephesians 2, 13 through 17, we learn that Jesus came and preached peace, that Jesus preached the good news of peace. And we know that he is the Prince of Peace. We know that he's the Sar Shalom, the director and the commander of peace, that where Jesus is, is the government of God. And in um, Isaiah, it talks about that of his government and his peace, there will be no end. So as the peace of Jesus spreads out, his government, his kingdom is established. And we know that eventually that that government will be like in Daniel, the rock that broke apart and spread out, the rock that was cut out without hands will spread out and cover the whole earth. His government and his peace will be the hallmarks of his kingdom in the whole world eventually. This peace is good news. It's the gospel. This peace establishes the government of God. So we fight with peace and in peace, and we fight by standing in peace. Next, the shield of faith. Now, we know that um, the others, the, the first three make up a, a unit. So here is something that we're not putting on, we're taking up. The shield of faith is the rhema of God, the, the now word given by God. Now, faith shields our entire being. Verse 16 says, above all, take, taking the shield of faith to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. If we live by God as truth, righteousness covering our emotions and conscience, and peace as the foundation for our feet, we can easily have faith as a shield. For an example, a bad report comes. Picture the spies in the wilderness who came back with a bad report. What did Caleb and Joshua do? They looked back to what God had said. And that way they didn't, they had a shield of faith. They didn't take in the evil report that was actually not God's report. It was a report spoken by the enemy, which, by the way, kept the children of Israel out of the promised land for their entire lifetime, for 40 years. So faith will shield our entire being, but you have to start with your your emotions being covered and walking in peace. And our faith is in God. So what happens? We get an evil report. Now we know that God has generally spoken good things to us. So what do we do? We drop down and get our peace. In some cases, we may look back to something God has already spoken to us. Sometimes we need to pray and get a now word and hear what God is saying in all this. But that is being shielded by faith, our shield of faith. And the flaming darts are the bad reports, the disappointments, the adverse circumstances, and 
sometimes the wrong thing we can even end up telling ourselves, which we need to catch very quickly. Now the helmet of salvation. I would have put this right after the breastplate of righteousness, fitting in with the, um, the open, the keeping doors closed to the enemy and open to God, our thought door and our emotion door. Philippians 4, 6, 4, 6 says the peace of God that guards our hearts will also guard our minds. Remember the enemy, the thought door, and the emotion door? And by the, the, um, the helmet of salvation, the Greek word for salvation here is used interchangeably for salvation, healing, deliverance. It carries the idea of being physically healed of diseases and also to be delivered from the enemy. If we keep salvation, what all, the deliverance, what all God has provided, covering our thoughts, we won't take in those negative thoughts. And it's been said that you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you don't have to let it build a nest in your hair. So we pay attention to thoughts, and just because it's in your head doesn't mean that it's something that God is saying. So, and that is a very good test for not taking off your helmet of salvation and throwing it away. Is that thought something Jesus would say to me? Is that thought something Jesus would say? And, I mean, forget you, you can say bad things yourself. So use the test, is would Jesus say that, or is Jesus saying that to me? And remember, every thought has a corresponding emotion. So if you hear a thought, then don't immediately take in a negative emotion that comes from that thought because then the devil's hooked you. But if that happens, you can always receive forgiveness and get your peace back, and that removes the hook. The helmet of salvation. Pay attention to your thoughts and your emotions. The devil has no other ways to get access to the inside of you. Next, verse 17, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, among the six items of armor, this is the only one for attacking the enemy. Jesus used it during the wilderness temptations when the devil came to him. He countered everything the enemy said with, it is written. So, of course, we have our Bible, the Logos, but also God will give us specific now words or rhemas out of his word, plus he can say things that aren't directly in the Bible but are scriptural to us. And when God speaks, we have an offensive weapon against the enemy. However, we don't take up the sword first. We put on the girdle of truth, the breastplate for our emotions, the shoes of peace, and we take up the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation. And when we're entirely protected, when we don't have chinks in our armor, then we can effectively wield the sword of the Spirit. When we are in here interceding on Sunday mornings, what the Lord speaks through the mouths of his little lions who are assembled here under the big lion, we can believe and accept and rejoice in what God speaks. We can decree it then. We can declare it. We have a weapon to use against the enemy. And by the way, it's been said, is what is the sword? Is, is the sword the word? Is, is it the spirit? What exactly is the sword? And the truth is we have three that are one in the sword. It's a sword that cuts. It's a, um, an offensive weapon. It is the spirit and it is the word because we know the spirit and the word when spoken by God are one entity. So, and finally... Verse 18, the last thing that we are told to do in wearing the corporate armor is to pray always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. 
That is the seventh item mentioned, and that is what we are doing on Sunday mornings. Under our individual armor and in the unity of the Spirit, which is the bond of peace, we're told in Ephesians, unity is something. Unity is not a concept. Unity are real, actual, spiritual knittings of the heart that can be perceived. I remember um, one time we had somebody here, this was years and years ago, uh, did worship for us. And someone was here and said, she's not a part of you. He picked up that there... She did not, she was not in unity with us. She was not a part of this fellowship. She was not joined in spirit. It's something that's perceivable, that can be felt, that um, when we come on Tuesday nights, God said to create an upper room. The mark of the upper room was one accord, which is unity. Now, in wearing that corporate armor, we are ready to come against corporate strongholds. And I want to talk about personal and corporate strongholds a minute. A person can have an individual mental stronghold. It's like a padlock or practiced way of thinking. Um, when we're praying with somebody and they, they have believed a lie, like I'm a failure, they have historical proof because they failed at a lot of things, but we know that's not just, I mean, just logically, as people who know the Lord and have read the Bible, we know that God doesn't deliberately set out to make somebody a failure. That's not, that's not his, uh, a God-created destiny for somebody. When we believe a lie like that, it came in at the time of emotional wounding, so we, all we have to do is say, Lord, where did that get started? Um, a person can say that to themselves when they mess up or they can hear the words of somebody else saying, you'll always be a failure and take that in and it can become a mental stronghold. However, once we receive forgiveness, forgive the person who said that originally at the entry point, then, then we have broken the power of that thought that was in the emotion and they can renounce the lie and now they can receive the truth. The padlocks have been broken, so their mind is open to hear what Jesus says about them. So that is a personal stronghold. Now, um, a personal stronghold, I would say it always has some demonic help, but there might not be some obvious demonic oppression on it. But when we talk about corporate strongholds, we're talking about a network of demonic entities that has taken the minds of groups of people captive. Um, now, you have authority in your own home to do warfare. However, when we're talking about corporate strongholds, Paul enumerates them in... Um, Ephesians 6, 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness. Those are four <clears throat> different levels. And I think it would be obvious to you to um, know that there's some similarities in spiritual warfare to real, real warfare, and that a general would not send a single soldier out to come against an entire army. I mean, that, that's almost amusing to think about that. So in the same way, to, for spiritual authority, we need to be part of a unified group. And um, one of the examples of that was Gideon, the one that God's used so much with Dennis. <laughs> Gideon's army of 300. Now, it didn't look like an army of 300 would be enough against the enemy that they faced, but because they were 
in unity, they had an additional level of power that made them effective when they were in one accord. Now, cautions about dealing with strongholds, corporate strongholds. Don't battle a stronghold unless the Lord has specifically given you an assignment. The Lord has specifically given us an assignment for this region. And now pastors have authority over their own churches, but some individuals, some leaders have authority over regional, city, state, or national entities. Um, Paul said he knew his fear. He did not get out of his fear of influence that God had assigned to him. He didn't get into um, other people's spheres. So you have to know what, what you've been called to and stay in that sphere. Now, the American Heritage Dictionary defines a principality as a territory ruled by a prince or from which a prince derives his title or the position, authority, or jurisdiction of a prince. Now, Daniel talks about this in the Prince of Persia, about the Prince of Persia that he came up, uh, was praying about that particular uh, principality. Now, the principle that we operate by is when we pray in tongues corporately, Father God is doing the warfare. We're not, we're not privates jumping around and, and challenging the devil that I've been in prayer meetings, corporate prayer meetings in the past where we did engage in more hand-to-hand -hand combat. Didn't see a lot of fast answers to prayer. Now, um, then we traveled, our group of corporate intercessors traveled to Brownsville the Revival Center in Pensacola, and we were privileged to go into their worship warfare meetings under Lila Terhune and knew what she was knew what she was doing, knew that they were they were dealing with dark forces and all that. But they had a worship team in with the intercessors and there would be dancing actions, um, movement, and then later we would get an interpretation of what we had acted out. We were acted uh, acting out in worship and dance, the heart of Father God. Now, this was for the Pensacola area. And by the end of the evening, we would get a report back from the sanctuary about the strongholds that had come down and the people had gotten saved one night the church filled up with prostitutes coming in and saying, what, what must we do to be saved? I mean, it was so, this was, this was warfare from the Holy of Holies. This was Father God doing the warfare as we cooperated with him. And it opened my eyes to there is a, an entirely different level of effectiveness that we can reach as intercessors. Now, you can look around and see examples of these corporate strongholds. One is the wokeness, the young woke people, some old woke people, um, who use the same buzzwords and they all sound alike and say the same things and you could argue with them all day long and no amount of mental reasoning is going to break through that stronghold because their minds have been taken captive. Um, communism, socialism, um, some religions, um, promiscuity and pornography. Um, the Nazis are a very good example under Hitler, the minds of the people in an entire nation were taken captive, including good Christian people who in the past would not have been able to justify the genocide of an entire group of people, the Jews. 
And yet there were churches that had their uh, congregation singing hymns as the rumblings of the trains carrying Jews to the death chambers would could be felt in their churches. Their minds were taken captive. There's also carnal theology or license, the, the grace message that we don't have to worry about sin because it's all been taken care of that we're under grace. Well, the Mosaic law was done away with, but God's moral law certainly never was. Jesus raised it to a higher level. So what God has given us here is a corporate strategy. Dennis has been talking about this a lot lately, that God has prepared a people for his purposes, for this church, and for this area. It's not all about us. God has given us a region on our hearts. And he, Dennis saw that when he drove across the North Carolina line for the first time, and he saw this whole region burst into the flames of the glory of God. That was when he first came down to the Charlotte area. And God gave him in 1991 a strategy for the end times, and that strategy is unity. Remember, unity is not nothing. Unity is something. And Dennis and I were in, this was early on, Dennis and I knew that we had unity on, in our, on our hearts. Um, but we were in our prayer time and we were yielding to one another in our spirits. And we were in one accord. We were yielding to God and Jesus manifested in the room. And I burst out and I said, this is one accord. And Dennis got, I say to you, if you agree on earth concerning what they ask, it should be done where two or three are gathered in my name. There I am in the midst of them. How many times have some of us seen Jesus in this room as we are in unity? Now, in 1991, God gave Dennis the verse Judges 6, 14 through 15, 15 through 16, and he showed him Gideon's strategy, and God appeared to Gideon as Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace, and God gave Dennis Gideon a strategy to defeat the Midianites, and it was a unified army of 300. And God delivered the Midianites into Gideon's hands through this army of 300 in unity. It's God's remnant strategy, the power of unity. And God told Dennis he would see unity but not immediately in these areas. In worship, hearing the word of the Lord in unity, in corporate witness, in corporate work, and finally, the last one was set in place in corporate warfare. Judges 6.16, to strike the enemy as one man. When we came to this building, God said, you're not a church. I want you to create an upper room to birth a church. And then when we got back from Morningstar into this building, God said, okay, start meeting on Tuesday nights. Now is the time for the upper room to form. But what God is saying to us we were bones in the valley of dry bones. We were once scattered, dry, and thirsty. God brought us together, healed us up. He's connected us into unity. And now is the time that he's breathing breath so that we can live and become an exceeding great army. So when we come together, Come in wearing your individual armor, knowing that we are under corporate armor, and the enemy is not going to be able to stand 
against what God is doing here. And I've heard this before. Didn't believe it. This was in their early years and there'd be churches that say, we'll take this city for Christ. We're going to take this region for God. And it's going to be amazing. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.